Hello, and welcome to the Pediatric Nursing Journal podcast series. This series provides extended content relating to articles published in the journal, such as author interviews and roundtable discussions. Before we get started, we have a special offer for our listeners. You can save 50% off a one- or two-year subscription to Pediatric Nursing Journal, the premier resource for evidence-based clinical information, research studies, and advances in child health care. Simply visit pediatricnursing.net slash offer for more information and to take advantage of this special discount. The September-October 2019 issue of Pediatric Nursing featured a guest editorial authored by Joe Mass, a retired nurse manager who is active in issues of equality, civil rights, and local behavioral health awareness. In her editorial, entitled Compassion at the Border, Ms. Mass discussed her first-hand experiences of volunteering at the Romero House, a migrant shelter located in El Paso, Texas, and close to the U.S.-Mexico border. Her many responsibilities at the Romero House included taking care of undocumented immigrant children, who were often scared, hungry, and in need of health care. In this episode, pediatric nursing editor Dr. Judy Rollins talks with Ms. Mass, who elaborates on her experiences at the Romero House and the positive impact anyone can make simply by showing compassion. We are pleased to present Dr. Rollins' interview with Ms. Mass. Hello, I'm Judy Rollins, editor of Pediatric Nursing Journal, and it's my pleasure to welcome Joe Mass, author of our September 2019 guest editorial, Compassion at the Border. Welcome, Joe, to this episode of the Pediatric Nursing Podcast Series. Oh, thank you, Judy, for this invitation. I'm really pleased to be here to talk about my experiences down in El Paso. Well, thank you so much. First, I'd like to hear a little bit about what you did while you were working. I know you're retired now, but if you could tell us a little bit about the kind of work you did before we hear about your work in El Paso. For 18 years before I retired, I worked as a nurse manager in a urology clinic in Anchorage, Alaska, helping build a small clinic into the largest one in Alaska. After I retired, I took a part-time job with the Anchorage School District working in the Parent Resource Center to help parents that had children transitioning from high school into the community, children with developmental disabilities. So I loved that job, and I learned a lot with that job. I'm glad you had an opportunity to work with parents and children. So we've all been very disturbed about the treatment of asylum seekers at the border. Can you tell me how you got involved and what helped you make the decision to go down there? Well, I had been following what was going on down at the border and frustrated that I was not participating in much. I was writing letters, having conversations with people. But when a friend of mine from Colorado called to tell me she had just returned from El Paso, where she had spent two weeks down there working with the asylum seekers, the migrants, and she suggested strongly that I get down there and do something. So I didn't hesitate. I said, yes, I think I will do that. I rallied some troops here. I took two friends from here and then my cousin-in-law from Cambridge. And we all met in El Paso, went down to El Paso. And that was how I went. First, we had to apply, though. It was through the Unitarian College of Social Justice, which is in Cambridge, Mass. And you have to apply. You have to be healthy answer a lot of questions, and then they said yes to all of us. So that's how I got involved. After that, it was simply a matter of buying plane tickets, finding an Airbnb, and renting cars, and then we were set. Okay. Did they give you any kind of special orientation or training to be working down there? Not really. We had information sheets, what to expect. When we got there, We were assigned to a particular shelter. I understand they chose what shelter based on where we were staying, our Airbnb was. So all four of us were assigned to the same shelter. The training we were supposed to get when we got there, and it's hard to describe how busy those shelters are, but we did sit down for about a half hour, 45 minutes with one of the leaders there, and she ran us through what our jobs were, and then bang, we were right into it. Oh my goodness. (laughs) 
Could you tell us a story or two about some of the children you work with, what kinds of interactions you had while you were there? There were a lot of children, a lot of beautiful children. This shelter mainly had mothers with children, fathers with children, and single men. So the dorms were separated that way. The children we mainly saw because they were ever-present. There was really no time to sit down and play games, read a book, although there was a playroom for them, a pretty large room. They would follow all the volunteers around. They loved practicing English. They loved going through the used clothes, going through the children's clothes. And they also were very clingy to their parents. It was kind of a combination of relief for them to be someplace that they felt safe and still frightened to death and wanting to stay with their parents. What kinds of things did you do while you were there? Well, the shelter itself was an old, <laughs> I think it had one time been abandoned, cement building. It was fairly large. It was fairly old. And it was right next to a Border Patrol training center. So perhaps it had been part of that at one time. What we did there, the shelter would get a call that ICE and the Border Patrol were releasing, say, 70 to 80 people to our shelter. And they would arrive in a bus. Now, there were two kind of volunteers. The ones that spoke fluent Spanish were the ones that did intake on these people. These migrants already had designated someone in the United States that would vouch for them and pay for their travel. So the intake people would arrange for all that, and the rest of us would find beds, find hygiene packets, find clothes, and make sure that everybody got a meal while they were first there. Other than that, when I primarily ended up in what they called the clinic room, and it was really just a room with a huge amount of donated over-the-counter supplies of medicines for diarrhea, for colds, a lot of respiratory problems. So that's what I did there. The clinic was not run by anybody. Two afternoons a week, Sister Isabella would come in. She was a wonderful, wonderful woman from El Paso. And she was a nun and had been a nurse. And she more or less ran the clinic. And then she showed me what she was doing. And so when she wasn't there, and I was, I would take over those duties. And the clinic simply meant that people would line up to come in, a lot of children, a lot of runny noses, a lot of GI upset, and you would take temperatures and pass out medicines, and if need be, you would call a doctor who was willing to answer at any day, any time of the day, and then if a hospital visit was recommended, then you would go to the emergency room with your client. So I did that once with a woman that had persistent vomiting. We went to the emergency room, and she was there for about four or five hours. And she was from Honduras, and she had learned to speak basic English by watching soap operas on TV. So she was the first person I really had a conversation with in English. I asked her about her journeys with her young daughter. She had traveled. It had been two weeks it took her to get there by train and bus and walking. She had fled Honduras because of the fear of the violence for her daughter, and also the economic situation. She said she could not find a job. She could not pay for anything. So that was her reason for coming. So that was kind of what I did in the clinic. It sounds exhausting. You know, I want to say it really was, you know, for (laughs) we would go home at night for four old retired ladies. (laughs) I don't think we have to have anything to eat. Let's just go to bed. Oh, sounds like you did some really good work down there. I really did enjoy it. But, you know, one of the reasons I wrote that article was there was so much bad news about what was going on down there between the Border Patrol and ICE. And I was told, actually, that before the increase in number of migrants arriving, the Border Patrol was very willing to work with the shelters. But things weren't that way when I was there. But there were so many people that were helpful that I called the compassionate people that I ran into down there. And number one, El Paso is a majority Latino community. But the volunteers that I worked with were from all over the country. I worked with Peace Corps volunteers, students on break, retired people like myself, just generally a lot, a lot of people were down there. And they changed. That was the other thing. It wasn't like a whole group came in at one time. 
no, one day this person's time would be up and then there'd be another person. You got to know a lot of people. But as far as the other people I appreciated down there, all the people that were worked at the bus stations and the airports, when you would take someone, a group of migrants, there they were with their traveling papers, their bags of peanut butter and jelly sandwiches, and you would go up to the check-in counter at an airline. I had to do that three or four times. Every time the person at the counter spoke Spanish, was polite, was respectful, and helped make that a really smooth transition for the people traveling. The same with the two bus stations that we would take people to. I will say this volunteer job wouldn't have been the same without the cars we had. We rented cars, my friends and I. And so we were able to do all of this. The hospital, nothing but respect and good treatment. The migrants themselves at the shelter really wanted to help. If you walked out with a bag of dirty something, someone wanted to take it and carry it for you. Someone wanted to break down the boxes. The women wanted to sort laundry. Everybody wanted to help and to do something. Also, I wanted to mention that the donations that we received came from all over the city. Clothes, food, money. Everything runs on donations down there. It's hard to believe that that's possible, but that's how it was. When I had taken that woman to the hospital and they released her, we needed to stop and get some medicine on the way home. It was late at night, and I stopped at Walgreens. And the prescription was going to cost 180 some dollars. And oh, my goodness. Yeah, well, you know, I don't know what it was. I can't even remember. But I said to the pharmacist, I said, well, this is for someone in the shelter. And he said, come back in a little bit. And he had other customers. And I came back, and he had, with whatever magic he did, brought it down to 20 some dollars. So everybody seemed to be wanting to help. I'm sure there were people down there that were not real happy with the migrants, but I did not run into them. We did a lot of shopping while we were there. The Walmart that where the mass shooting was, that was the Walmart we shopped at all the time for bread. Goodness. Sounds like really an amazing experience. Have you ever done similar volunteer work with any other group anywhere? In 2006, when Katrina, the hurricane, I had first moved here to Bellingham. I'd only been here about a year. I was working, volunteering with the health part of the Red Cross, and I went down to Katrina with the Red Cross. So I worked in Montgomery, Alabama, and trips to Jackson, Mississippi, to shelters. So that was one of my other major volunteer things. What kind of work did you do when you were there? In Montgomery, they had set us up in a huge empty Kmart or Walmart that was mainly phone work at that point, talking to people around New Orleans in the rural areas. So many people were affected by mold, and it was dangerous in a lot of places because it grew so fast, and people were having a lot of respiratory problems. We needed resources. Hospital records were gone. It was just problem-solving constantly. Thank you for all the volunteer kinds of things you've done. Nurses can really do so much in situations, and it's just wonderful that you have taken the time to do that more than once. I think it's just wonderful. This last one was it was a very humbling experience. I don't know if I told you the story, but I will tell it now. About the shoelaces, you don't realize how important certain things are when the migrants would get there. Every single one, I would say, every child, every adult was missing shoelaces in their shoes. They had been taken away by ice. And so we would go into the dining area and put a big box of shoelaces out, and people would just swarm all over them. I've never seen people so excited about shoelaces, but that was also an amazing, humbling thing to me to give people that kind of little bit of dignity. Do you have any thoughts that you'd like to pass on to our listeners about doing volunteer service? Volunteer work is important to me. I've always done it. But it also depends on where you are in your life. Are you working full time? You know, what can you do with that? I would encourage anyone to do it. It's a learning experience. It takes you outside of yourself and your own world. In case anyone is interested in doing this kind of volunteer work, you might start by going to the Unitarian College of Social Justice website. They still keep up with what's going on. There are many websites out there. And then the New York Times, in an article, February 22nd, there's an editorial called He Turned Purple, U.S. Overlooks Ill Asylum Seekers. 
And it's not the El Paso crossing, it's Brownsville, Texas crossing. But the lack of medical care being given. And then another website I really wanted to mention was Human Rights First. They have an article that was written in January 28th about the migrant protection protocol, which is what's going on now. The situation when I was in El Paso is no more. The shelters are not full. People are not coming into this country. They're being sent back across the border into Juarez and to wait there, and that is a dangerous situation for all of them. I just want to thank you so much for taking the time to talk with me today and sharing your expertise. Judy, thank you for asking me. I really hope that, you know, it's helpful in some way to people. Thank you. Thank you. The Pediatric Nursing Journal podcast series is owned and produced by Genetti Publications, Incorporated. All rights reserved. No portion of this podcast may be used without written permission. Ms. Jo Mass is a retired nursing manager residing in Washington State and is active in issues of equality, civil rights, and local behavioral health awareness. Dr. Judy Rollins is the editor of Pediatric Nursing and president of Rollins & Associates Research and Consulting in Washington, D.C. For archived episodes of this podcast and to learn more about pediatric nursing, visit the journal's website at pediatricnursing.net. You can also subscribe to the Pediatric Nursing Journal podcast series on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, TuneIn Radio, our hosting site Spreaker, and everywhere you get your podcasts. And remember, as a listener, you can save 50% off a one- or two-year subscription to Pediatric Nursing. Simply visit pediatricnursing.net slash offer for more information and to take advantage of this special discount.